Hola, bienvenidos a esto que es el vínculo perfecto. Mi nombre es William Caicedo y los saludo desde Cartagena, Colombia. Es un placer para mí estar en este espacio que The New Covenant Group uh, eh, nos ha permitido tener para hablar de lo que más importa para nosotros, lo que realmente, en lo que realmente deberíamos meditar, que es el amor de Dios, y en cómo podemos reflejar ese amor en nosotros para alcanzar con amabilidad, uh, con bondad a aquellos que lo necesitan, ser la imagen de Dios. Hi, my name is William Caicedo. I say hey from Cartagena, Colombia. This is the perfect bond. Love is the force that binds everything in perfection. And this is why we've chosen this name, uh, because uh, it's this is a space that, it, that is devoted to talking about what really matters the most, that is the love of God, and that's what we should meditate on and we should uh, reflect on in order to um, reflect that love and give it to others, the ones that really need, need it the most. Um, uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, something that uh, I've been, I've been uh, pondering a lot lately because of certain things that uh, happen. Um, and also because we as uh, as Christians, we uh, seem to have pretty different interpretations sometimes of the same texts, and there are a lot of opinions about all kinds of controversial stuff. And so, for a perspective uh, of uh, Jesus Christ and a perspective of of the way that God does things and it's been on, from this perspective of the kingdom of God we're trying to we're going to try to examine this and actually we came with a phrase about the Bible that uh, we came up with a, uh, with a phrase about the Bible that in our uh, in our um, opinion reflects accurately the nature of it we say that The Bible is a Rorschach test. Um, we're going to talk about it, uh, about that today a little bit. What is a Rorschach test? Okay, a Rorschach te test is this psychological test, um, or psychiatric, I don't know, psychiatric test that where they uh, present you with a, um, an ink blot or with uh, some uh, pieces of. Uh, uh, I don't know, paper or, no, or a book or something uh, with, with ink blots and each ink blot has a different, a specific form or different uh, form. And the, uh, the uh, person that is administering the test to you, uh, ask you um, asks you, what do you see on that blots? Or what that blots means to, mean to you? Or what uh, uh, the, the blots look like? And given your answers to that, uh, the, the professional can uh, trace uh, some characteristics of you, of your mind, of the way you think, or um, maybe even a diagnosis of the stuff you, you have in your mind. <laughs> um, but it, it is interesting because uh, uh, they are try with this to appeal to the subconscious part of our heads, or I don't know, our minds. And it's surprisingly uh, telling. Our answers to the Rorschach test are surprisingly t telling to the uh, trained eye, or to the trained uh, train, train professional. Uh, and it's not really uh, uh, apparent why is that that is so, because Uh, you're, you're just you're just seeing an ink blot on a on a piece of paper. How can that reveal something about you and your subconscious and and the way you think and that kind of stuff? It's interesting, and uh, part of it is because these ink blots are, uh, are are so generic and are so um, devoid of a particular form they are they kind of open to an abstract okay thank you Joey abstract they are so abstract this uh, 
blots are so abstract that um, it gives uh, the opportunity to the people that is actually watching them, uh, taking a look uh, to them, to supply their own interpretation of it. Uh, it's very, it's it's like abstract art. It's you see a picture, the the painting, and you can give it whatever meaning to it. Maybe that that's why they call it art. But in this case, uh, it, it, it these uh, blots are an amazing uh, source of information about the person that is actually looking at them. That's why uh, psychologists or psychiatrists use it, use those to diagnose people. In this case, what we what we are saying is that the Bible sometimes uh, acts, sometimes uh, functions as a Rorschach test because the reading of the Bible uh, actually lets me know or tells me more about the person that is reading it than what it tells about God himself. And this is no heresy. <laughs> because in relative, relative terms, our vision of God tells m more about us than, what, that, than, than uh, what it tells about, about God because God is actually so big. Well, the concept of the creator of the universe has to be so big in order to be able to create the universe that there is actually no um, possible comparison be between us and this concept if we want to use a very generic meaning of the term God. Uh, but that's why I'm saying I'm saying that this is no heresy. It, it, it says more about you and me. The way I read the Bible, the way I choose certain uh, certain parts of the Bible in order to make up doctrines, the way that I pit uh, verses to each other, the conclusions I I I get to are actually telling a lot lot more of me because they they are sometimes they are my the products of my mind or the products of my reasoning and also because I'm finite I'm, 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 I have a beginning and an end I'm a quantifiable uh, phenomena my my mind is a quantifiable phenomena um, I it's a lot it's co actually it's comparable to those conclusions God is as as uh, we tend to to feel or we may think uh, God is actually unquantifiable. It's actually it's, it's, it's outside uh, the reach of our means to quantify things. So in, in relative terms, it's, it is our vision of God, the way we read the Bible is telling more about, about ourselves than what it says or tells about God. We all have a favorite texts in Scripture. We all have this... Uh, for example, a particular verse that we like a lot, a particular verse that we like to to repeat, a particular uh, book of the Bible we like to read above others, or these verses that you put on frames on your walls and stuff. And the verses you you like from the Bible, your favorite texts tell a lot about the way you think, the way I think, the way I relate to the concept of God, the way I relate to, to my brothers and sisters in Christ, the way I relate to the, my brothers that actually don't believe in God. It is it's very telling. And if you've been in, in, in this game of Christianity long enough, you maybe you probably know what what I am talking about. It's, it's very very telling about people. Theologies are very telling about people because theologies are
Oh, ladies and gentlemen, William looks like he's in so much pain. Let's uh, give him a call back. We will be right back. Enjoy the music in the meantime. Hi, we're back in line with the perfect bond. We were uh, telling you that uh, we were talking about that uh, it, it's more telling. Theologies are more telling about ourselves than the, the, the things that they tell about God because of uh, re relative terms, actually, and also because uh, those are part of, uh, products of our reasoning. And we could use the, pr those products to infer the mind behind that product, those products. And uh, sometimes we say that we have complete certainty about God's things. And sometimes, sometimes we feel like we have all the answers. And also we feel like we own the truth. But uh, the question that, that is in my mind is, is that actually God, uh, what God really wants, us, wants from us? Um, if I take, for example, uh, priest, a evangelical minister, a Buddhist teacher, or a Hindu, I don't know, guru or stuff, and I ask every one of them uh, about what's the truth or something, they all, all will very, it's, it's very likely, it's highly likely that we'll, they all will claim ownership of truth maybe in uh, an explicit way or maybe with using some sort of words but uh, 
um, in the end, they all claim certain uh, ownership of truth. Because we feel, just as I said, complete certainty about, about what we, do, uh, we don't see. In this case, I'm talking about God's things. Um, and over the years, uh, I've, actually, I, I've came to appreciate uh, a I don't know more than I used to. And I don't know is quite, uh, quite an honest uh, answer sometimes. And it, it gives me the opportunity to find out, but if maybe I'm fixed on a particular answer that turns out not to be the real truth and I give no opportunity to wonder about those things because I'm already, I already have my truth, I already have my answer, maybe I'm missing the point entirely. Because, and, and, and I'm sure that God doesn't want me to, uh, maybe Dr. Jones say something, said something like, park my mind. Maybe that's not the idea. Having 100% of the truth implies something that we usually don't think about. It renders, uh, uh, it renders us unable to learn anymore. Because if we already know it all, uh, what else can we learn? If I have absolutely no uncertainty about a thing, the way the, the dynamics of, of this thing, the way this thing relates with other things, and I know whatever I I have to know, or whatever that whatever that can be known about that thing. I can learn for I can learn a single more thing about it. My mind is actually uh, practically parked about the thing, and when we see certainty in this world. Or when we see these human thoughts, these human uh, doctrines, these human uh, uh, products, all these products of the human mind that claim 100% certainty about things, uh, probably um, history uh, <laughs> have, tell, have tell, told us that um, good things that don't happen. Good things uh, that uh, don't happen when when people claim absolute certainty because we became we become we become blind uh, uh, maybe about the real stuff that is underneath our perception and talking specifically about the Bible uh, when some denominations or or doctrine or specific churches or confessions of faith uh, claim 100% uh, certainty about doctrines and stuff. Um, I can help to think that the Bible is a collection of books written a long time ago by people from different cult cultures, different times, different places, written using a dead language, a dead language that uh, ha have been translated by different people, that has been translated by different people, also removed from our current context. Um, uh, and yet, we still believe that it's only matter, a matter of reading it and interpreting it little, literally. It's a matter of just uh, taking for granted all the things that are uh, written on those pages in a little fashion, literal fashion, literal way. And when we do this, then we go on to claim that what's written there literally gives us the right to claim ownership of the truth, of, of absolute truth. Is that rational is that uh, something that uh, has logic on it 
No, it doesn't. It, it, it has no logic on it because uh, if we actually get uh, conscious about that thing, though all those things, we get conscious about all those things, then uh, we, we will be uh, we would be dishonest if we keep on claiming one hundred percent percent certainty on those things, but. Maybe that's the point that we don't claim 100% certainty of the things that we can see with our eyes but feel with our hearts to keep us humble. And to think that the truth is better exemplified by words on the pages of a book, whatever book it is, flies in the face of the very uh, things that are written on that same book, I'm talking about the Bible, the relations that has uh, have been uh, known to us are actually uh, quite different from this thought that a literal interpretation of words in a in a um, book are actually uh, the truth itself. For example, that's not the very same scripture that we idolize sometimes. It tells us that the truth is Jesus and not a book. We read in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus answered. No one goes to the Father except through me. If you had come to know me, then you would come to know the Father as well. From now on, you will come to know him. You have seen him. Actually, I'm using this translation that's called the Source, the Source New Testament. And it was, this is a version that was... Uh, um, put together by a lex lexicographer called an, 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 an classical Greek scholar called Anne Nylon from Australia. Um, I'm reading it and I'm liking it so far. So uh, I'm not using, for example, the NIV this time or, or the KJV or new KJV on all those versions that sometimes I tend to use. But I'm using this time the source entity. Um, maybe in a later show uh, we will um, uh, learn a little bit about this translation and other things that make make makes it a very interesting translation of the Bible. Okay. Also, does not Paul say that in this moment we see through a glass darkly? How can we claim 100%? certainty on things, made of physical things, if Paul himself is telling us that he, with all his revelation, the revelation he had received, he can just claim that he just claimed that he is able to see through a glass in a dark, darkly way. How will we want uh, first of Corinthians 13 verse 12? That reads like, for now we look through a mirror in a riddle, but then we, we look face to face. Now we have knowledge in part, then we will have through, thorough knowledge, just as we are thoroughly known. It's interesting uh, that this translation does not say uh, through a glass darkly or, or imperfectly, or the words that useful translation, uh, translations use, but it says, uh, for now we look through a mirror in a riddle. It's, it's a very interesting uh, way to put it. It's a riddle. It's, uh, we ha don't have all the answers. Sometimes different parts of the riddle seem to be counter, uh, to counter each other. Sometimes it doesn't seem, seem to be very consistent, but it, it is there. The truth is there. But like looking through a mirror in a riddle. That's not the very scripture 
tell us that Larry kills, but the spirit gives life. That would be Second uh, Corinthians, Corinthians uh, three verse six. That says he also made us adequate ministers of a new covenant, not of the written law, but of the spirit. For the written law puts to death, but the spirit gives life. The letter kills for the written law puts to death. I've I heard this week. Um, I saw. I watched the video that Bob Graves, the unconfessional pastor, uh, posted on Facebook about Arch Archbishop uh, Puhalo, Laser Puhalo, or something from the uh, Orthodox uh, Church. He said something very interesting that the pursuit of morality above all things is actually heresy because. It, it, it counters the teachings of Jesus Christ that actually uh, favored a, an inner transformation that flows out from the heart. But faking it, faking that transformation by focusing too much on morality is it's not the spirit. It's not in the spirit of, of, of those words of Jesus. It is because reading laws, if, if, it, if that is all we have, kills us they don't give life does not the Bible say that God things have to be spiritually discerned first Corinthians 2 verse 14 a soulish person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are stupid in their eyes and they are not able to recognize them because they can only be closely examined by spiritual means but the person who is spiritual closely examines all things, but no one is able to close, closely examine that person. <laughs> That's a very interesting uh, uh, thought. Uh, but in the end, the things of God are not discerned like we sometimes uh, discern a literary uh, work. Because there's something more to it. It's not a novel. It's not just a story. There's something more to it. Because it's the Spirit of God that's trying to use. This mean, the Bible, this, uh, the Bible is a mean, as means to enter your life and, and to help you. There's something more to it. And that something more, that bit more has to be Spiritually discern, not literally discern. That's not a scripture that tells us that the true word of God is Jesus the Christ. John, John uh, 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word stayed with God, and the word was God. The word with uh, a big W over there. Word. It's Jesus Christ, not a book, not a letter. He is the actual, the, the real Word of God that became flesh, not a book. And of course, not my interpretation of what the book says. That's why we could argue that your, your interpretation, my interpretation, Your interpretation, uh, the conclusions that you arrive to uh, when you are um, reading the Bible. And we should note that we uh, have uh, endless different interpretations of the same passages, passages. And because of that, we have endless denominations of Christianity and outside Christianity and all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, um, then we could say, uh, because of this, that your and my interpretation, the way you read, the way I read, talks a great deal about our spiritual condition. If you assume that everything is revealed in the book, where it also, it's also said that in the future we will know thoroughly, as we've been thoroughly known, 
They don't know what else to learn. You have their self-defeating uh, uh, proposition because you're claiming that literally reading that book is only the truth. But if you read that book literally, it also says that you won't be able to own the truth right now because you don't know as you've been known. It's not in our, um, it's, at, it's not at our, at our reach right now because there are things that we cannot bear right now. In fact, often a judicious learning of reading, excuse me, reading of scriptures leaves more questions than answers. And that's not bad. Not at all, quite the contrary. I dare to say that that's precisely what God intends, since those questions force us to think, to meditate, reflect, to debate with ourselves. And your conclusions reflect what's inside you. That's why the Bible, given you the opportunity to supply it with your, uh, your own biases, your own man-made theology, your preconceptions and stuff, actually is allowing us to see through you. And it's allowing you to see through me. My interpretation of the Bible is allowing you to do that. The fact that God seems to be hidden. And the fact that the Bible often leaves us with more questions than answer, answers. Those two facts reveal the true colors of the heart. In fact, Blas Pascal said it very clearly once. Pascal say, said that in faith, there is enough light for those who want to believe and enough shadow for those who don't. That's interesting. In faith, a piece of evidence can be regarded as a pointer to God, a pointer to love, the love of God. And that piece of evidence can be regarded also as a pointer to the non-existence of God outside faith. That ambivalence for all things creates uh, a lot of uh, problems sometimes, but also uh, gives us the give us give us the opportunity to to reach our own conclusions and, and those conclusions are sometimes as unique as we are unique. In fact, this thing that Pascal uh, talks about here, in fact, there is enough light for those who want to believe and enough shadow for those who don't, is something that uh, Jesus seems to allude in Luke 12. Let me, uh, for example, uh, reach out to uh, the Gospel of Luke. It's uh, a very interesting thing here. Um, I'm gonna, I'm going to look, f look out for, look up for you. In the Gospel of Luke, there's an interesting. Uh, uh, story in Luke 12 verses 41 to 48 just give me a minute to look it out for you look it up for you I would be Luke 12 I'm gonna use uh, the source anti version Luke twelve forty one. It says the following. Um, Peter asked him, "Lord, do you mean this example is specifically for us, or for everyone?" Jesus answers, 
Uh, then who is the trust, trustworthy and wise manager? Jesus answered, who the boss puts in, puts in charge of his servants to give them their, their, meals, their, their meals at the correct time? That slave servant would, will, will be doing well if the boss finds him doing the right thing when he returns. In fact, he will put him in charge of everything he owns. What, but what if the slave servant thinks uh, the, boss, the boss is taking a long time getting back and then beats up the male and female servants and gobbles up his food and gets drunk? The boss will turn up unexpectedly on a day he doesn't expect and at a time he's not aware of. He'll chop him, he'll chop him in half and send him to the same fate as the unbelievers. Quite uh, stern words, and, and they paint quite a picture. Um, there, there is probably a lot of hyperbole involved here. But what we, act, we really can see is that, or, or the parallel that I'm trying to, to pull here is that if there is no one watching you, and there is not a clear list of do and don't, then you have to make choices for, your, for yourself. And those choices reflect who you are. So those choices uh, expose the true colors of your heart. And when you have a book that is so difficult to interpret, and it's a book that is so abstract in some parts that uh, gives gives rise to a hundred different interpretations. The, your choosing of a particular interpretation is going to say a lot of you. Is going to say a lot of of me. That's what I'm talking about. And the master is not looking. The servants or the butlers can make whatever they want. They can do what whatever they want to do, whatever they want to do, because at some point, the consequences of their of, of their of their uh, actions and the um, the things they chose are actually going to come back and bite them on the on the butt. <laughs> all of us, that's that's true for all of us. Some. Uh, there's something else. I've observed the following. Some texts in the OT are especially preferred by people who just love judge other, to judge others. Some texts in the OT are especially preferred by people who agree, for example, with capital punishment. And in fact, they use it to uh, support their views, their views. Some texts are particularly preferred by those in the OT, in the Old Testament, by those who think material prosperity is an unequivocal symptom or of spiritual prosperity. Because King David was a very wealthy man, and right now, uh, and also King David supposedly had a heart uh, just the way God wanted him to be, to have it. Uh, so right now, what I my conclusion would be that if I do have a heart that is uh, what the one that God wants me to have, then I should be should be as wealthy as King David. Yeah, you can you can support that line of thinking with the NT only. You have to resort to the Old Testament in order to to make such a conclusion to to get to such such a conclusion. But. When people talk talk, uh, talk to me about the OT, I ask, aren't all those passages supposed to be read through Jesus' eyes and not the opposite? Well, Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant. A covenant that renders invalid the first covenant. So we should maybe see and interpret all those things by through Jesus' eyes and not the opposite. Because if we start backwards, uh, interpreting Jesus through the lens of the Old Testament, we maybe 
could arrive to different conclusions. For example, we could end up thinking that it's okay to commit murder. We could have, could end up thinking that God is a God that who's God is a God who's willing to hurt you real bad every time you make a mistake. We could even think that God doesn't love you. We can end up thinking that God is a God, a God of revenge. And is a God interested in paying blood with blood. And he's a God interested in wiping out uh, entire nations because uh, they are sinful. Or that he is a God uh, that wants to fry th three quarters of humanity because they don't believe in him or they, they didn't make the, they didn't do the uh, correct prayer, for example. Sounds familiar? I bet it sounds familiar to you because it sounds familiar to me. That's tradition. And that's why we, we started backwards interpreting the Bible. Why then don't we start by how the one that said the following actually th see things? No one has ever seen God at any time. The only son who is God, the one who is closest to the father's heart, he is the one who led the way to the place of honor at the father's side. That would be John, John 1 uh, verse 18, the source New Testament. Here we have a guy that is claiming that he has such uh, a point of view that is so advantageous that he can actually peek into the heart of, of the Father and make him t known to humanity. And this guy is claiming that everyone before him did not possess this, this point of view, so their conclusions are probably biased. And if we trust this guy, then why don't we see things through his eyes, from his point of view? When we do this, when we try to do this, scripture becomes into something other. And when we do this, the scripture is no longer just an Russia test in order to reveal what's inside you. It's a record of how humanity started from a place that was very, very f removed from the conscience of a God of love. And it started to climb his way back to that concept making sacrifices in order to feel worthy to the God. May, um, then starting to realize that the thing that really matters is not sacrifices, but making justice and having mercy. And finally, getting to the point where they could actually understand a revolutionary concept as love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you so you can be sons and daughters of your Father who is in heaven that is actually perfect. Scripture turns into a witness of God's love. Scripture turns not into an idol but to an arrow that points to the real Word of God. The appearance or the Word of God into appearance of man, the Son of God and also the Son of Man, that who walked like us, dressed like us, talked like us, to let us know what was in the Father's heart.
but will be Jesus Christ. Scripture turns into something different. And maybe we should do that. Never, never uh, forget that the Bible reveals more, more of us than from God. And maybe we can use our reading, our doctrines, or our theologies as a starting point, as a diagnosis, in order to see how removed we are from Jesus, which is actually uh, the one we should measure up to at every moment, to strive to be more like him. Because if we want to follow the ways of the Father, then we follow Jesus. Um, we have a couple of viewer comments. For example, uh, <laughs> the first one say, says that, isn't Rorschach that guy from the show Welcome Back Carter? Well, actually, I wouldn't know <laughs> because uh, the only Rorschach I know, which is a character on TV, is the guy from the, um, this movie and this graphical novel called Watchmen. It's the only Rorschach I know. <laughs> and I like that guy. <laughs> and there's another comment. I don't think that much of the OT is the word of God. For that matter, also the, the NT is not the word of God because the word of God is Jesus himself. But I think that there's a lot to, to we can learn from the OT. Yes, there are, uh, for example, there's this saying that goes like people that, does, that don't know their history is, is condemned to repeat it. So if, you, if we're just for that point, that one, then it makes it valuable. I've I've said this before. I see the, the OT as an as a record, as how humanity progressed from a very archaic um, place with animal sacrifices and this notion that we had to appease our God to a place where we slowly discover that what actually matters is what inside our hearts. And then to a point where God himself takes the appearance of a man to show us what's really in his heart. So maybe it's not the God of, it's, it's the word that came directly from God's mouth. Maybe uh, there are stories that were concocted in order to give the ancient Israel a sense of nation and a pride and being the blessed ones of God and stuff to create like a uh, mythology to support the nationalistic, um, I don't know, plans or something. But is this helpful to read those things and to scavenge for some real nice truth pearls that are buried in a, lot of the, in a lot of dirt. So it has its purpose. Surely it has its purposes. Okay, um, this is it for today. May the peace and the love of the Father be always with you, my beloved brethren. This is the perfect bond, and I hope to be with you next time. I say hey again, hey again from Colombia. My name is William Caicedo, and God bless you. Bye-bye.